forward to that. So perhaps we can start now, Dr. Tu. It's uh, nine, two minutes already. Yep. Yeah. Uh, welcome to day three of the this conference, everyone. I'm so excited to see you all again. And we get excited already about Dr. Tu Ngo Blinri's speech today. And it's my true honor to introduce her to um to you. And you can uh, see in the bio, but it's such a pleasure um for me uh, to read it out loud. Dr. Tungo is a senior lecturer in language and literacy education, uh, School of Education at the University of New South Wales. She is the director of the Bachelor of Education Primary Honors Program, commencing at the University of New South Wales. In 2023, I think too, not 24, right? Um, uh, to teaching focus on the uh, case um, kinder to use English curriculum, her current research takes the systemic functional semiotics approach to exam children's literature filmic adaptation. And tools work focuses on conceptualization of literary meaning realized by language, visual, sound, elements of film, and to uh, publications you already lifted in the bio, and I'm sure we are all impressed with her work. So uh, with no further ado, Sarah, it's over to you, Dr. Tungo. Thank you very much for uh, your pleasure speech today. Thank you very much, um, Ving, for the pleasure to be able to share my work um, with colleagues all over the world. So thanks very much for the opportunity. And again, I can't just say enough about I can't just have enough words to say how much I appreciate uh, your effort and the team's effort to put this together. It is for people coming from um, um, countries that are not so close to Australia, it will be a lot of um, money and financial effort to be able to make it to a, an international conference. So. You are doing an amazing job. Thanks very much for your initiative and all your work. Okay, so um, it's my pleasure now to share my work with you, everyone. And uh, and as you can see from Ving's introduction, um, I'm an education um, focused person. So I use a systemic functional semiotics perspective perspective to try to solve. Um, education issues so when there is an when there is a, a a requirement or where there is a demand for doing something in education um trying to like we all you know try to solve the problem and so in the new new south wales syllabus um there is a whole new strand on uh, understanding and responding to literature and so with that literature, it means it's not only written literature, but also multimodal digital literature. As you can see here <clears throat> in this um, selection of text for K-6 to or kindergarten to year six. And so only with this um, primary school stage, uh, the range of texts that teachers need to do include film, media and multimedia. So this is First of all, um, education driven. And also, I also would like to respond to um, the call for the demand for real multi in multimodality research. Because as you um, have seen from many um, of our well known um, multimodality work on film, a lot of them have been focusing on. Um, the visual part of it outside of language and there is there hasn't been much uh, not much have been done uh, in terms of sound apart from works that are pioneered by Theo van Leuven and so um, this is also you know research driven and so um, my ultimate aim um, for doing this kind of work is to come up with a conceptualization of the meaning potential and the literary meanings of um, all film elements. Um, but in this talk in particular, um, I look at a film sound. So what, are, um, what can film sound do in terms of storytelling? Telling what can sound do in terms of storytelling, and uh, if we want to, so 
unlike written literature where you have the language to um to to you know construct a story or to do all this literary work um it is not the same anymore in film where the visual and the sound is taking a lot of part into this and so but in the real teaching context not all primary school teachers are music teachers they are non-muso and not all of the multi-modality researchers uh, have music background and so what can I do to come up with a conceptual framework that everybody who doesn't have any in-depth music training or um, t um, technical understanding of music can also talk about film um, uh, about film sound, talk about sounds and um, in, make interpretation about film sounds. Because uh, I also come from the background of a non muso So uh, before I started this um, research, I didn't have any idea. I didn't know music. I only, I'm only a music listener. I'm not a music re player even. I sing, but that's about it. Okay, so um, that is the um, that is my my goal, to help someone like me um, be able to interpret and 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 talk about music, um, so that we can help our um, students, primary school students, to also talk about music. Okay, so before I start, I would like you to experience this. Um, this video clip without sound okay so this is um there's a little bit of a background this is a an excerpt from the story called the graffalo the graffalo is a little um children's picture book and this is a children's picture book and it was adapted into it was adapted into a movie Okay, so this is the uh, when it was adapted into a movie, not there, not everything is repeated. So there was some creation by the filmmaker. So okay, so let's have a look at this without any sound. Okay, so I think okay, after you watch that little excerpt, all you can see is a squirrel jumping out of the um jumping out of the log and jumping around. That's all. Is that right? If you uh, if you want to make your comments, you can put in the chat what do you think you have seen? Okay, so if you think about a uh, story structure that have or orientation complication resolution, this is a still maybe somewhere very early on. There's only um <clears throat> orientation happening here, and uh, nothing much else. Okay, but if you put the sound into it, you start to see further than just the orientation bit. So let's have a, a listen.
Okay. So that's that's that is about what you hear. So it puts a completely different experience for a viewer when you can listen to the story. So I can I can say in advance, I can foreshadow in advance that um <clears throat> what you have heard in the previous slide in in this um video clip is not only the 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 squirrel jumping around yeah, as you may have seen but you can hear it's digging 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 um into the leaves because you can hear the rustling of the leaves so that is the action you know, the action of the squirrel uh, more than uh, what you can see visually because it's so tiny, you may not pay attention to um to the digging, but the the vi visually you may not see that tiny little detail. But the sound, if you pay attention to the sound, you can hear it go. Okay, so I'm going to play that again. That's it. Okay, and then two more. You can hear two more of that. Okay. All right. And now from the beginning until now, what you see is just repetitive, gentle music playing. There is no drama. But now, just keep listening. You will start to hear the drum coming in. And then you will hear the rising of the pitch and the rising of the volume. And then when it reaches the, the tree where the word graffalo, and, and pay attention to the root of the tree, it looks like the claw of, of, um, of a beast. The claw of a beast. So the, the root of the tree looks like it. And so that is when the music started to be dramatic and uh, you will start to hear the rising of, um, of the pitch, the rising of the volume, and also some tremolo or the vibration in, in the instrument. Okay, so it's like, oh, it's like that. So when you're trying to scare someone. All right, so um, just listen to where you can hear the drum comes in. Pum, 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 pum. So the drum comes in, but in the background. Um, on the foreground, you still hear the melody. Let's listen to the drum again. It's in the background. Now, woo. Okay, so there's a kind of tension. Okay, there's a kind of tension. So the one note is prolonged and a sustained. Um, then you can hear some tremolo coming in, vibra vi vibration in the instrument. And the percussion too, the percussion. Okay, the percussion is, is playing. Okay, and then all of that comes. To, then it comes to the tree. So that's the next scene. Okay, the first scene. That's what you could see. Okay, so if we look at the visual only, there was just like the orientation, maybe the very beginning um, phase of the orientation, the squirrel, or if we put it in writing, it would be the, squir the squirrel got out of the um, a nest uh, looking for nuts. Uh, when it came to a big tree, it found a nut. That's all uh, we could see if we put this in, in words to describe visually. 
Um, but the music here is doing something different. The music here is doing the orientation. You start with something gentle, something repetitive, like uh, so the re repetitive structure of the music tells you that this is an extended activity. It is an extended. Okay, so it's like it's repetitive, means this is the kind of activity that's repeated. And then you hear the sound effect of the scratching on the leaf. Right. And so all of that happened until you hear you hear this hint of drama. The hint of drama is was done by the the drum. The drum started to go um <clears throat> pum, 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 pum. So the drum, the drum beat was in the background, and then you started to hear the rising of pitch and volume. Then you have other uh, instrument coming in. You started to hear the tremolo, you started to hear some percussion. All of that add to the tone color of this piece. So add to the ambience. So the ambient is like, this is scary. Oh, there's some tension here. Okay, so if you put it into the story structure, it's actually coming to the climax. So if you think about the story structure, your orientation now, then your rising action, there's a climax there. But visually, the squirrel is not aware of any of this. The squirrel just kept going, just kept doing what she was doing and uh, oblivious to the fact that some danger is happening. So the the sound or the, the music, the sound, not just the music, is um, preempting, is foreshadowing to us what is going to happen next. And as it unfolds, um, the squirrel, the mother squirrel, was in danger because she was being hunted by an owl. Okay, so that will have the story unfold. Okay. So I have basically summarized the application of the conceptualization framework uh, into interpreting this piece of the just little, uh, maybe 40 seconds of the this part of the uh, video clip. So how can I come up to that, um, to the ability to make that kind of interpretation? So the rest of the story, um, I mean, the rest of my work has been looking at ideational, interpersonal and textual meaning of film sound. But today I'm only going to explain to you about the ideational function of film sound and uh, what it does for film, um, for uh, filmic storytelling is in terms of constructing plot. Okay, so just a one um, tiny part of, uh, of the work. Um, I'm going to explain to you how I uh, come up with the, the interpretation that I was able to, um, to just share with you. Okay, so that's a question. Um, there is a lot of background that we have to go through. First of all, if you want to think about, okay, how is the role of film sound in constructing plot? Uh, as a literary concept, we have to understand what is a plot? Okay, so when we are uh, looking at plot, we look at uh, literary studies and plot is one of the three um, key elements in, 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 in literature and they're intertwined. So plot is about the what of the story. And it happened, it answered the question, what happens? And plots are built of significant events. Uh, events are those that lead to consequences that are around incidents. So just, uh, okay, there are many different plot types. And so we think about plot type, I think we think about something in the field there. And the plot types is also going to um two ways interaction bilateral uh, interaction to the kind of music's going to be unfold or this kind of sounds going to be unfold so if you have a if if this uh, story or the film is a comedy story the kind of music that is going to be used in there will be different from the story that are um or the film filmic story that are um 
a like a um a, a thriller or a um, uh, or a or a scary um overcoming monster some kind of a scary movie okay so the plot tie will also help you know kind of um two ways interaction with the kind of sounds you hear in the um in the unfolding film and we look at plot structure there's um four basic plot structure um the graphalo story that i've just showed you um has the episodic structure whatever kind of structure that it has there is still a pattern of uh, orientation rising action resolution a climax and resolution it always have that um it just you know put in a different um patterns okay so this is a story that we were talking about and like i said it has a um episodic structure when the, it was adapted into this movie it also um follow the episodic structure so when we understand when we want to understand plot we need to understand first of all events order of events and causal relation between events and so this raises the questions um what is the role of film sounds in constructing or interpreting movie plot in terms of events order of events and causal relation between events <clears throat> so this is the data that we've looked at and i can just um preview the answer is that film sounds can complement visual image to represent events it also can also um represent order of events in uh, generic stages and phases of the story but it can't represent causal relations between events this is what um the uh, the the job this is the job of the visual and and the language to do it so how do i get to this answer <clears throat> i'm uh, aware of time so i will have to skip a lot of um background formation but this is the methodology uh first i have to um understand uh, what are film sounds and then how do i segment when i want to okay now i know what are film sounds how do i segment a film into units for sound analysis and how do i understand within a sound unit there will be different layers of sound so how do i understand different layers of sounds in a sound unit, what does each of the layers do in terms of storytelling? And how are they, uh, and then what are the meaning potential? How are they related to event or the sequences of event? Okay, so these are the kind of answers that I have to go through. So I will, okay, this is the, um, from reading film studies, uh, this is the kind of, um, network uh, that I come up with the options so when you listen to a sound a soundtrack there are four kind of sounds that you can observe and, uh, and they also include silent because silent doesn't just mean that they don't do anything silence also does something um, particularly when you look at when you look at the effects of tension um, silence is something sh shadow uh, represent or shadow some kind of tension so, so there will be a a, a completely um uh, a separate section on silence but I'm, i i don't have the time to share with you today and so we have speech sound music and sound effect that are audible and so uh, what are sound effects you may um you may wonder Okay, so you can see that you, everybody knows that um, music is music. You can understand what music is and you can recognize music in a film. But sound effects sometimes, they are um, quite similar to music. And so I've got this continuum to um, kind of help myself and I think for teachers to distinguish uh, what is 
sound and what is music. And so with um with sound, so we have it on the continuum here, uh, with um less visual dependent and more visual dependent. So we have here something realistic and indicative sound. With realistic, uh, when you hear a footstep, is a footstep. When you hear a siren, um, it is emblematic because it may mean something else. So a siren is just not the noise uh, from a, a vehicle. It means mm, give way. Some someone is in a in an emergency. Um, or the horn. The horn blowing in a battle which means this is a starting of a battle. So that that kind of noise, um, noise doesn't mean negative, means uh, okay, it's signaling something. That's why it's this kind of um sound I classified it as uh, emblematic. Then we have symbolic, symbolic sound. They are um, in the middle between realistic and indicative. Because they mind the realistic noise, but with exaggeration. Ex ex <laughs> I have a tongue twisted when I say this word. So when you hear the heartbeat, okay, that heartbeat is not actually, it, you can recognize as a heartbeat, but it's not actually a realistic heartbeat, just miming the rhythm and is miming the frequency of the heartbeat but the volume is much um, louder. And then you have musical noise. Musical noise is like noise that are that sounds melodious. For example, in film, you often hear sound music, a sound, sound effects such as twang or um, ooh, things like that. So they are like representing in the middle, in, in in between, something realistic, but also uh, um, put melody into it. And then on the other side, we have music. Okay. And so it, I kind of, it helps me because I was very confused uh, with sound and music. Now, um, there is nothing real about sound in, in film because all of them are designed. So we can't say that the sounds in films are real. None of them are real. They're all designed. That's why um, they are semiotic resources, yeah, all of them. Okay. Right, now I'm coming up to the second question about segmenting, um, segmenting sounds. Oh, how do I um when I can't just you know I can't just analyze um film sound from the beginning to the end of a film because I think you can all if you like just as a listen an, an ordinary listener without any trained um training in music you can you can identify boundaries between one sound clip or one soundtrack from another. Uh, because there are transition points there. And so, but in um, in film studies, literature, you can see that people have been uh, talking about units of film uh, in terms of scene, short, and frame. And many of our um, um, social semiotics researchers uh, who work on visual also use this, um, this kind of uh, unit analysis. But um, it doesn't work for sound because with one soundtrack, it will color two scenes. So it so it doesn't just one soundtrack fitting in with one scene. It will go over. Okay, so that is a textual meaning of um of of um of musical text in in uh, filmic storytelling. Uh, which I will talk to you later. But what I'm trying to say here is uh, we can't use the visual the unit um, for analyzing film sound because it doesn't work that way. Okay. So uh, what is the solution? Uh, I rely on um, Van Leuven's work um, in terms of rhythm for 
um, segmenting units of cells. So in, um, in, in film, there are um, three kinds of um, track that you can see in film. They are dialogue track, action track, and soundtrack. And they divide film into rhythmic unit. Some of the units, um, the dialogue is more prominent. In some other, the action is more dominant. In, in, in others, sound is more dominant. So sometimes uh, one of these tracks uh, takes the dominant function or role. And so the largest, um, so with rhythm, so the rhythm now, it doesn't just mean the rhythm of sound, the rhythm of action as well. So if you get up in the morning, you exercise, you work, you eat, you work, you rest, then you work again, then you exercise, then you have a shower, whatever. Then you go to sleep. The next day you do it again. So that is a real rhythm of action too. Okay, so the rhythm doesn't mean just the rhythm of sound. It's the rhythm of action, rhythm of dialogue, and rhythm of sound. And so this kind of uh, rhythm um, demarcate a film into units. The largest units um, are easily recognizable by viewers and they have the transition points. Here I've come up with these um, kind of units and I just call them phase. And um, Theo van Leuven also call it phase as the largest um, unit of sounds. So here is the um, the network of how can you recognize the transition point between one unit and another. So if you have a, a dialogue unit, this is how you recognize the transition point and so on. So for a sound unit, you can recognize it. Um, this is the end of music or there's a new tempo or the new pitch. Um, there. Okay, so I will... Uh, now when we have been able to identify a film unit uh, in which you can see three tracks, dialogue, action and sound, one of these track will take, uh, like I explained to you before, I use the word dominant and technically we call it, it's the guide rhythm. So in a film unit where there are there exists all, all of these three tracks exist together. Um, one of the track will take the guy rhythm and we call we'll call this a monophonic filmic uh, unit. And this unit will be more dominant and other um, tracks will be submitted to this guy rhythm track. So that is called a monophonic uh, monophonic. Um, film unit, but there are also other kind of film unit that not only one track takes the dominant role, uh, but two or more tracks can um, can be um, fully synchronized. Um, and so, for example, in this um, little clip that I explained to you before, is a um, the monophonic um, unit, but this one music guy at the beginning. After that, the dialogue guy, and after that, the music slows down, um, and the music guy. Okay, so it is not um, sometimes it's not absolutely one uh, the whole time, but they take turn. Okay, I I don't think I will have time to show you, but at the beginning here. You can see that the music is going its way um, and the action is doing is having its own um, rhythm. So this one is a polyphonic um, rhythm film unit. This is the, the bit that I show you at the beginning. Okay, so when we think about ranks in a, a music rhythmic unit, <clears throat> here is the thing that I just um, shown you before. So it's also um, sync with the filmic um unit and just um to make us um be able to relate with something that we already know which is the phonolo 
phonology terms. So I'll phrase in um, a measure, a measure um, is like, it's like a syllable, uh, it's like maybe a word. It has an express that has two syllables. For example, measure. So we have me and ja. So it's like a word with that. And then um, see here we have, um, it is equivalent to foot because it has one salient syllable. Um, and a phrase in music is similar to a tone group. Okay, so, so at the beginning when we were um, watching the film, the beginning part of it, now we can go back to it and we can see that in the, um, in the little um, clip that I, uh, excerpt that I show you at the beginning where the squirrel went out, got out of the nest looking for nuts, um, that is the first phase. And then when the squirrel found the nut, oh, I didn't finish showing you this, but the first, I show you the first phase of this unit. Uh, it ends with a long ending note and the transition point is when you can see uh, visually, you see the, the graffalo tree uh, with the word graffalo in there and after that there are two other stages of uh, phases so I, I should have changed this to phases uh, I was playing with the terminology so you know, still kept it in my in vivo analysis um so the second phase was when the mother the mother squirrel already found the nut and uh, the baby squirrels was playing until an owl appeared and threatened a squirrel. And that phase ended with a long sustained ending note as well. And you can recognize as a transition point. The third phase was when the mother squirrel returned home and began telling the, um, the baby squirrels a story. And this phase ends with a complete stop of music. So we can go back to it. Um, and within the first phase that we watched at the beginning of this presentation was there were three moves. The first move, the gentle, um, cyclical or repetitive um, melody uh, of the guitar sound is the setting. And then when the drums started to emerge is another move it's called rising action. And then when the ascending volume and high pitch, I think you can still remember this, was a climax. So we have three moves in the first phase. And so this is a kind of um, segmenting segmentation that I um, uh, I apply for understanding um, the film sound. And now we're going down the rank to the phrase. Um, in this move, boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. So you can hear, you can see that. Okay, I'm gonna play this again. Okay, that is, there are eight phrases in this move and you can hear it in sync with the percussion um, drum. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, and then this is one measure. It, it has a pattern of um, explicit pass and a weaker pass. So this is stronger and weaker here as a pattern. So um, we have gone through the different ranks in, in a um, sound unit. Locating sound in a film unit. Now we got a film unit. We know that we can rank it up and down. So we have a big film unit, like we have a, a phase. We can recognize it because the transition point is quite clear. Then we move down to the moves and to the phrases and then to the measures. The musical text, um, you can hear them in moves or you can hear them in phrase. Sometimes they take the guy rhythm 
the sound effects, you can identify them in a phrase or you can identify them in a measure. Okay, but now what if we have one sound unit that is a musical text, but it also has many different layers. So at the beginning, um, in the example that I show you, you can the melody go da -da 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 -da, and then you started to hear in the background the drums started to come boom 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 and then up on the top you hear the tremolo you hear the vibrato okay so these are in one unit of sound you actually hear three layers or um or perspective as um Van Leuven put it. So um the foreground, the middle ground, and the background layers. When you change perspective, when you change the perspective, you are when you change a hierarchy um in a, in a sound unit, you are changing your perspective. So for example, in this um in, in this example, you can hear the, the, the changing in um, the row, which what is put in the foreground. So what is put in the foreground is what you want the audience to pay attention to. So at the beginning here um, of this bit, the foreground is a music text, but the middle ground is the mother squirrel going, hmm, and you hear the footstep, you hear the leaf rustling, and you hear the background, the bird chirping, the insect clicking. So let's just listen to, you can just try to see if you can actually tease out the three layers. Okay, starting from here. And then the mother squeak will go, hmm. Okay, you hear the footstep, the rustling of the leaves, and then hmm, again. Okay, so what is put in the, and at the very background, did you hear the bird chirping and the insect clicking? Oh, the knot. Oh, wait here, you two. Now, the speech sound is put up front in the foreground position. The music goes down to the middle ground. The footsteps still there in the background. And so the background sound, what is put in the foreground sound, the foreground layer, um, draw the audience's attention to it. But what is put in the background um, doesn't mean that it doesn't have a role. It tries to create a realistic, um, lifelike story world with the setting and the movement. So it's co more convincing. It's more convincing to to the um the viewers okay so um i in in my work i try to answer what do the um what do these music and sound effect do in in these positions um we need to understand their affordances first to understand what it can do so here is this kind of power Oh, then what it, can it function? So <clears throat> we look at um, a music text in terms of all these measures. I don't think I will um, have time to explain to you, but these are the kind of um, components, uh, the elements that I have to look at in a musical text. And uh, with compositions, I look at the structure, the the instrument roles. Um, so the structure of music, you can hear, <clears throat> uh, it can be a progressive structure or repetitive structure. Progressive structure is like uh, represent um, an event unfolding naturally, but the repetitive structure is represent an event extending indefinitely. And so it also, you know, um, help you dis representing or describing the events in the story. So this is an example of repetitive or um, synclical structure. Okay, 
Okay, so this kind of pattern is re repeated and it's represent the walking, um, the rhythm of the mouse walking. Uh, it's like quite... Okay, and the progressive structure is what you can see at the beginning with the um, leading and then the rising and then um, the fading out. And so um, then there's all these kind of uh, different kinds of instrumental roles. So the melody roles, the melodic um uh, is going to do the foreground sound and the harmonic is doing background sound, creating an ambience, um, the tone the tone color role and the rhythmic role. All of them have a role, but due to the limit of time, I can't show you these. But just trust me. So, what I can come up with is that if we go back to the question what can film sound do in terms of constructing a plot okay we know that it can represent the generic structure of a story yeah with the progressive music composition so that is one thing it can do here, the progressive music con composition have uh, leading, rising, uh, climax, and fading out. Um, it can also represent events, okay? And how can it represent events? It represents events because of its sound quality or timbre and its repetitive structure. So I'm going to show you some examples of how sounds represent events. Okay, so this is an example of sound um, representing, so um, quality, is not re so realistic sounds can represent events. Where, where, where are you meeting him? Here, by the stream. <laughs> oh, and his favorite food. So when you hear that uh, water flowing, you can, okay, that's water flowing. That's an event. And when you hear the car beeping, you can hear the car beeping. But other kind of sound, you can't, you, you can't tell what is um, the actor of the action. But you can, you don't know um, the actor of the action, but you can only hear the quality of the actions, the property of the actions. So for example, you're going to hear um the cat walking and the cat jumping and it represents the intensity of the action the speed of the action and the pace of the action but you can't tell with that visual that is a cat walking or it's a human walking or jumping okay and um, it also represents music noise can represent the trajectory of action, the trajectory of, of action. So inward or outward by um, having the volume getting louder or softer and the pitch getting uh, higher or lower. So uh, you're going to watch this. And in this little clip, you can hear the twang sound effect mirroring the door opening so when the door open it open outward and so the volume also goes from soft to loud and the pitch go from low to high so representing the trajectory of action here perfect and the up and down upward and downward of action um, and you're going to watch this um, man he's looking at a note and feeling disappointed about um, the little tips that he had and as his posture droops 
um, you also hear the gliding down in peach. Oh. And you also hear the intensity um, of um, and the speed and the pace from this um, the bass line, uh, the rhythm, the rhythmic roll here. It's uh, also not only keeping the rhythm, but also representing or um, contributing to represent or in sync with the the manner of the walking steps. It's a heavy walking step. Okay, so there's the secret. Okay, I have a, I have a lot more to show you, but I think come to the conclusion now um due to the time limit so i've just um share with you a, um my i keep my working process actually this hasn't been published so it's just i'm still in my working process to um try to find down what um film sales film sales can do what are they film sales what can they do in terms of st storytelling and how how can it do it okay so i've shared with you that it can represent in terms of constructing plot it can represent this plot structure in a even common sense term uh, because of its progressive composition it can also represent events because of its timbre or in other words its voice its sound quality and its repetitive um, composition so sound quality looks at the dimensions such as pitch volume um, melody and stuff and so i think actions or um, activities in our life also have these some kind of um, quality that you can relate to in terms of um, of sounds. So the train, mm, the tracking of the train. So when you hear the the train running, the tracking, you can hear it is quite similar to um, a musical rhythm. And it also has the volume, it also has the pitch, it also has the rhythm. So the quality of the sounds in our activities um, can be related to this, the quality in music and in sounds. That's why um, sounds has the potential or has the affordances to represent events in that way. Um, so I come to this conclusion. So I hope that with my just emerging work, um, I can help myself first of all to do this um, multi-modal research, modality research. So not just looking at language and visual, I'm looking at sound and see the next thing to do is do how sound, language and visual work together as a, uh, as a complete ensemble for a storytelling. In education, um, this provides a toolkit for um, primary, maybe upper secondary, maybe secondary teachers for teaching um, multimodal digital literature. So it's looking at the subject content knowledge about what to teach. And as a matter of fact, that although um, a lot of schools in Australia claim that they teach films. Um, most of them say that I've we've used films in our teaching, but only 17% actual actually teach the multimedia mini making resources. And I don't know to what extent uh, there hasn't been any research or to what extent they pay attention to sound. Another application is that um, when we, of course, just like teaching any other um, semi semiotic resources, 
uh, sounds contribute to teaching critical thinking, critical literacy, as we teach filmic adaptation of written literature. So here is what is the story in written literature, and here is how the filmmaker recreated. Um, what is the different? What is the intention? So that is for um thinking beyond what is what is led in front of the students. The screen literacy is this thing that um Scotland is pushing um very well recently. Uh, it's about helping even um preschool preschool students to understand that what you see in the media or um in a multimodal text is design. Everything is design. What you see, what you hear is design. And particularly it design in a way that leads you to think or to sync with the maker's view. Um so you can find more about that in terms of screen literacy in Scotland. Uh catering for different learning styles. So I was thinking about teaching um, literature to children. If we um, show them, okay, now we need to, the narrative structure, the narrative structure, orientation, rising action, climax, and resolution where the declining action and then resolution there. We can model it visually through, in the diagram that I um, that I shown. Of course we can have the language and we can analyze the language in it in film we we can play this recording and listen to this everyone this is where you feel it because with the um sound it's actually we we can hear we can feel it without even knowing it that we are being affected okay so i think this uh, is a in a very rush I'd like to thank you all for your um, participation, particularly for those who have to wake up early or stay up late to watch this presentation. Um, I don't know if we, uh, oh, I'm so sorry that we have run out of time for question. Thank you, everyone. Wow, wow, wow. It's such a truly wonderful presentation, truly interesting and enlightening. Um, yeah, we would love to hear you forever for the rest of the day, sorry. But uh, we, uh, we have limited time. Uh, of course, we would love to hear other fantastic speakers as well for the rest of the day. But uh, it's such a wonderful start to the day. Thank you so much for your brilliant uh, presentation, Dr. Tungo. And now we have, I think we um, we have a few minutes for questions on, and comments. So if people don't mind, you can quickly grab a cup of tea or water, and then we can continue the conversation during the morning time, uh, the morning tea. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tungo already put uh, her email address um, on the first uh, slide, and it's already on the social media, and I'm sure uh, we know her mm -hmm. email, but just in case, I will... Um, uh, provide her email address as well. So please, everyone, we have a few minutes for questions and comments. One from your co-author, fabulous work to be inspirational. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Question, everyone. Um, Amelia has a question here. I was, I've been wondering what oh, okay. <laughs> on sound in film narrative has for students' use of sample in various types of video making apps. Okay, so I think this is also something that I um I talk to my um, pre-service teachers. So when I ask them to create a movie uh, using iMovie, there's a there's a bank, there's a library of of sounds um, that they can that they can choose from to put in their um like the, the background music for the film, and uh, one of the um. Uh, w one of the um, the sample that I had from my student was they were talking about um, they were making a f uh, an animation about the effects of tsunami. It's a very sad story, but they chose the background music from the iMovie library, like a hero come home, like a hero comes home. Uh, uh, music it was very funny, so it just adds a very 
kind of divergent um, effect on it. It doesn't it, it need to be gentle. It need to be emotional. You know, it's not like boom, 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 boom. Not like a hero come home. So, so for a student to think about, um, you know, or the ambience, um, and then representing uh, actions, a kind of action that are present in the movie. I'm not sure if I answer your question, Emilia, but we can talk more about this. There's a lot of uh, thing we can talk more about. Thank you. Another question from Binta and Marco in the chat box. Doctor Tu, would you like to have a look or maybe uh, I I will read them out now. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm reading Peter's question now. Thank you for your presentation. As you weave together symmetry resources from the domain of music side effect. Could you consider looking at the role of semiotic remediation, re-semiotication in the move story book to storytellings in movie? Peter, could you please clarify and uh, just, just <coughs> so I can understand it a bit more? Okay, thank you too for your presentation. I really enjoy it, it was fantastic. Um, I believe you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, you talk about storybook, um, um, uh, narrative stories in movies. Yes. yes. I think there is a move from storybook to a filmic production. Yes. Which is what you are looking at. Yes. Um, that is what about you call semiotic remediation. So you move. You it's a kind of adaptation yes. of what is in the book into a, a filmic plot line. Yes. So I want to say if you can look at it and look at semiotic remediation or what we call repurposing, reusing of uh, what you have in storybook, translating it into movie yes. project. So if you can also add it to your work. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. That's definitely. That's definitely. So in order to teach critical literacy or critical thinking, that's what we have to teach children. So here is the literary techniques that is realized by written language. And here is a literary yeah. that is realized by other resources that are not written. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I have a question. Do you think that oral sounds are also more important than writing as a tool of persuasion? a rhetorical device in the Graffalo, which mainly target preschool audience. How does it relation to sound pattern in a sense the sound portray the writer's view? So, okay. Margot, I'm not sure if I understand all of your uh, questions here, but I think you're talking about also speech sound as well, right? The speech sound, yes. So, um. In in my book about um, the parallel the the book that I co-author with uh, G. Martin, Suhut, Claire Painter, Brad Smith, and Michelle Zapivinia called Para Language. Um, yeah. In this book, um, I have a I have a section about voice quality, and voice quality. Um, look at how the voice, the speaking voice, can realize different kinds of emotion. And so it will be very, in this film, uh, in this the project, I, I, I don't look at voice quality because uh, I already did it in, in this paralanguage book. But it, when I write about film, yes, I have to look at that. And for um, teaching a primary school student, it's very important to talk about uh, speech sound or voice quality because if you are a literacy educator you would know about the two strands in uh, in reading one is reading comprehension one is reading fluency and reading fluency is also about reading expressively and with expressively it's not only the intonation but also the voice quality so you can for example in this uh, book when the graffalo met the fox the fox says um come and have lunch in my underground house. And then the, the mouse says, it's terribly kind of you, Fox, but no, I'm going to have lunch with a graffalo. So I can read the mouse um, speech in different ways, expressing different kinds of emotion, manipulating different ads 
parameters in my voice quality. He's terribly kind of you, Fox, but no, I'm, I'm going to have lunch with a, a Graflo. So you are portraying a completely different character. A mouse is very frightened, very scared. But he was say, it's terribly kind of you, Fox, but no, I'm going to have lunch with a Graffalo. So he changes the voice, he changes the character. Thank you. Oh, yes. So uh, did I answer your question, Mago? Thanks very much, Stu. Wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Timo, for all the clear answers and everyone for the questions. I think um, it's perfect timing now. We have uh, around seven minutes to get a cup of tea before we join um, the parallel session for this, evening, uh, this uh, morning. Oh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Tungo, for the brilliant presentation. And we look forward to seeing your paper published after the plenary. Book. <laughs> book, I guess a book, 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 next year for coming. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you very much again, everyone, and see you all again as the uh, 10 15. I'm going to open the breakout room now so you can join now if you like. Thanks so much, everyone, for your support and your, for your attendance. See you. I uh, hope the Rest of the day goes great. Thanks so much, Fiend. Thank you very much, too. You are welcome. Why don't you? Thank you. Yeah. The breakout room are now open, everyone. Please feel free to join now or ask 10 15.